Scott Gillum here with your beginning options lesson number nine, technical charting. From basic to advanced. The advanced part is going to be a follow along with just using a chart and each of the technical aspects of charting to make a trade. I'm going to go through them fast, pick up the PDF, take a look at it, and go through it on your own because it is multiple slides and I'm not going to take the time to interact with you on each and every one. So let's go on to this. But before I begin, remind everybody all rights are reserved and copyrighted for 2022 for Shadow Trader. That means the content in this presentation is presented for educational purposes only. It should not be considered as a recommendation to buy or sell a security. Therefore, information in no way should be considered investment advice. Trading of options involves risk and may not be suitable for all investors. All rights and obligations of options instruments should be fully understood by you, the individual investor, before entering any trade. A little levity to start this. Hey, you should buy a stock whenever the chart looks like a squirrel sitting on a clown's shoulder. Or in our case, a beaver, right? Okay. It's called technical analysis. I'm not going to do that. Good, because it doesn't work if everyone does it. This fallacy, folks is just the opposite of what happens with technical charting, technical trading. Technical trading is nothing more than drawing lines, finding indicators, oscillators, whatever you want to call them, and expecting other people to look at the same information with the same criteria as you do. It works because many people use it. It works only for that reason. No future price is ever known. It's all priced in the rear view mirror. But I'll leave you with this. Technical trading technical charting gives us insight into what the footprints are on the chart that allow us to interpret where pressure to the upside or downside may be based upon price and volume that we can use to make an expectation of future pricing. We can also use the options chain for implied volatility as a confirmation of what our expectation is. But this lesson is now going to look at the technical information that you should probably have on your chart or have the ability to do because a lot of traders, institutionals, even computers and bots use this technical charting aspect to make decisions. So be with the crowd, not against the crowd, and use technical trading. All right, we're going to talk about what's called moving averages, trend lines, some basics. We'll talk about some candlesticks, a 101 type of introduction to candlesticks chart pattern trade clues, not clues that I found, clues that other people who've done major research in pattern recognition that I'm going to show you. I mentioned Fibonacci's. We'll talk a little bit about Fibonacci's and their retracements and why they're a valid technical piece of information that you can use. Then we'll talk about trade placement criteria that I use personally, how I determine some of my expectations 
so that I have a bullish or bearish or stagnant type of trade. And then the last bullet point is this hindsight analysis, taking the stock day by day by day and adding the technical aspects that we'll go through here in the lesson and applying them to the pricing to make some decisionary buy-sell situational points. All right, let's dive into it. What is a chart pattern? Just a representation of what prior uh, buys and sells show up on the chart. Where do we buy? Where do we sell? Where do we open? Where do we close? So it's a representation of the actions of buyers and sellers. It's not predictive of the future. It's always looking in the rearview mirror. Price action gives the trader some signals about the current trend. Is it going higher, 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 or lower, lower, lower? Or is it going up and down and up and down and up and down? That's what those candlesticks and the trend lines and moving averages give us information about. A bullish pattern is one that represents the market currently moving higher in price. Bearish pattern, just the opposite, lower in price. Reversal. The reversal pattern. We go up, up, up. All of a sudden, we get to a point where it says, nope, that's too high, and we go down, down, down. That means if you think about it in the terms of an auction, prices gets bid up, 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 and then all of a sudden, the price gets to a point where, nope, too much, too expensive. I'm not going to buy that for that price. I'll pay you this. That's a lower price. Nope, not even going to pay you that lower price. It runs out of buyers and sellers start to come in to take over for the buyers. Chart patterns identified by connecting higher highs, higher lows, lower highs, lower low, or lower highs, lower lows, depending on if you're bullish or bearish. The primary tool, this line right here, the primary tool is what's called a trend line. Going from a high to a lower high, to a lower high, to a lower high, or from a low to a higher low, to a higher low, to a higher low, with more than two points. You need more than two points to make a line or a trend line, I should say. You can get two points to make a line, but three points make a trend line. Different patterns identify different markets. The bullet point, one from the bottom. The purpose of using patterns is to identify the current price action and to make a decision of whether to buy or to sell subsequent price action that follows. Now read this last one. Chart patterns is one of the most pure and simple forms of technical analysis and reactive trend trading, that means acting to price, is the, the result. You have to take this with kind of a grain of sand though. It's a guide Note guide to a breakout signal or to a, a, a failure signal and should be thought of that as a guide only. All right. Now, this is why I say print out the PDF. Here are some typical price actions. We've got a bullish pattern, goes up consolidates, breaks out of a channel. This is called a flag, goes higher. Or a pennant where the two lines are starting to converge. Breakout is a buy point. Here's what's called the cup and handle. Price goes up, gets to a zenith, comes down, rounds the bottom, goes back up, gets to the same level that it was at at the beginning of the rollover, 
and then pulls back slightly and then shoots up higher, called a cup and handle. We've got the ascending triangle. We've got a symmetrical triangle, measured move, up, consolidation, same move as the prior move, consolidation, same move as the prior move, consolidation, and so on and so forth. I've never used this one, ascending scallop, but it is valid. And this one is called three rising valleys, or a move up, a retracement, move up, retracement, where the lows are subsequently higher, higher, and higher. And we've got a breakout point when we move above the higher highs as well. So these are typical price patterns for a bullish. We've got bearish ones. I'll leave these to you to take a look at. Just note that there are pricing patterns that you should kind of be aware of, and you can use them to infer the next price movement on your chart. Let's move on to moving averages. What is a moving average? It's a mathematical calculation of the average of closing prices used as an indicator for relative strength. This last three words, or five words, indicator of relative strength. Here's how it works out. Our favorite and most reliable ones, we use what's called a 20 period. So we take the last 20 closing prices, add them up, and divide that by 20. That gives us a number. The next day, we take off the late, or the oldest price, and we add the current price. So we always have 20 periods to add together and divide by 20 for a 20-period 20 moving average. The next one we use the most is the 50-period and also the 200-period. These work on any time frame. Note the word period and not day, not minute, not hour. It's periods. I don't care what you use in your charts. A 20-period moving average uses 20 periods from what your chart is showing you, 20 bars. So use it in the, the right way. It's called a moving average, or in this case, simple moving average for 20 periods, 50 periods, 200 periods. Why do we use them? Because they simply give us a mathematical calculation of where the last 20 days prices average out on a an undulating um, line. The way we use them on our charts, we code the 20 in green, the 50 in red, and the 200 on in blue, as you'll see for a lot of the Shatter Trader charts. All right, let's now go on to trend lines. Trend lines are ones that show the direction of movement, upward, downward, or stagnant. Those are the only three trends that you can have. Uptrends, where do we start those? Well, we start the upward trend line or the bullish trend line from the lowest level that we want to see on, or we see on the chart for a price. This is inclusive of both the things called wicks or the, uh, yeah, wicks, which is the highest high or the lowest low, plus the body. So the highest point, inclusive of all prices, we use the lowest point to start our uptrend line. Then, using the tool on Thinkorswim, let me illustrate that for you. Let's get a chart up here. Let me do this, just a clean chart. Let's clean that up. All right. 
This is the S&P 500. If I were to show you an uptrend, and I want to use this as my low point, these are similar, so I can use either one. Using the tools, we open up the trend line tool. And it's anchored at the start, and then we just swing it up until we hit our first line, our first low price. Well, that one's taken out by this one. And if I extend that out, this uptrend from the start, first touch, second touch, was violated back here on the 21st of January. Starting at 617, that uptrend was violated on the 21st of January. Came back to try and go through it on the 31st, came back to touch it again, on the second, did the same thing in what we call a look below. This is the tail or wick to the downside and closed on the trend line. Next day, closed on the trend line. The following day, we started on the trend line, moved higher. Then we rolled over and came back, touched the trend line again. So this trend line validates itself from the start. One, two, a break, near touch, three, a push up, touch four, a look below and touch five, a look above and touch six, a look above and touch seven, and now a touch eight, and then fails. So that's how I just used this trend line for a break, a retest, push above, retest to the downside, a retest again to the downside, a break and fail. All right, so that's what an uptrend line is. Downtrend lines start from the high side of the wick or the tail and then connect two, three points to make it a downtrend. Candlesticks. I just talked about that term candlestick. Well, this is a representation of open, high, low, close for the day in a graphical manner. Brought to you by the Japanese traders back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, but not adopted to modern trading until about the 60s. There are only the basics that I'm going to give you. These are road signs or where things start and, and went to on the high side and low side. Their predictability for future movements is uncertain. They need confirmation of a following day. So here are some key candlesticks. What's called a doji, and this is the doji right here. In a candlestick, we've got this going on. I've got an opening price. I've got a closing price. In between here, I've got movement. Well, on a candlestick, we put that as usually it's a uh, drawn in or a colored in level. So I've got the open and I've got the close. Well, we may have had a look about, uh, you know, these wicks to where we've got a look below. It looked down here and moved back up. And it looked up here and moved back down here. These are the wicks. This is the body where we have in this case, open and close, could be open up here and close down here. In a doji, I've got the open and close at the same level, and I've got a little bit of push above and below. Now, there's multiple types of dojis. This is the typical doji doji, just a bullish doji. 
This one's called a dragonfly doji because of the insect reference to it. We open and close, but we only have the tail to the downside. We've got what's called a gravestone doji. That's the opposite of that. Opens and closes about the same, but we had a look above and fail, so it came back down. The reason these two dojis are just plain dojis, but tagged as bullish, tagged as bearish, is because of the prior pattern before the doji. Think of doji as indecision. I don't know which way I want to go, so I'm going to open and close at about the same price. That's what doji stands for. All right, we've got topping tails. I mean, topping candles, bottoming candles. So these are all called reversal types of patterns. When we go up too far, and then the next day we come back down. Or we go down too far, and the next day we come back up. A few of these are what's called a spinning top where the body is outside of the prior bodies, but the tail is inside. Or we have an evening star where the whole thing, the tails are outside of the prior and the prior two days. And then we have a morning star on the opposite side. Those are some reversal patterns. You've seen these. You probably kind of figured out what they are already. Other types of candles called engulfing, where the day's action kind of gobbles up the action from the prior day, or the prior day engulfs or takes on all of the movement of the current day. We've got a bullish pattern for a bullish engulfing. We've got a bearish engulfing. The last two are called Haramis. This means pregnant in Japanese. The reason being is that the body is inside of the prior day's body. The only reason it's bullish is because of the trend prior to this harami or prior to this bullish move, this harami is a bearish one. That's the only designation difference. People talk about hammers. Well, what are hammers? Hammers are where you follow in price, and it looks like a doji, but the body is a little bit larger. It looks like a hammer. It can be bullish, or it can be bearish. It depends on the prior day's action to determine whether it's bullish or bearish. A bullish hammer is preceded by bearish price action. Then a big drop or tail, a look below and fail at that price. No more sellers want to come in. Buyers take over. On the bearish hammer or a hanging man, we have a push to the upside. And what happens? The high price fails, and then things start to reverse. These are reversals, reversals predicated on the tail that they show. All right, there are typically four types of patterns that you should be recognizing if you get to be a technical trader. We've got triangles. They're all kind of triangles, but a symmetrical triangle where the downside angle and the upside angle are equal. We have asymmetrical triangles or flat bottom triangles or flat top triangles. They're ascending or descending types of triangles. We have a pattern called a head and shoulders. And then multiple bottoms or multiple tops, triple quadruple bottoms, triple quadruple tops. 
Let's take a look at some of them. Here's a symmetrical triangle. The angle of the trend line from the tops to the downward movement being a bearish trend and from the bottom coming up being a bullish trend merge. The breakout point comes when price goes outside of this triangle, either a break up to a bullish trend or a break down to a bearish trend. I've shown you only the break up or the breakout to the upside. Here's the ascending and descending triangles where one side of the triangle is typically flat. So the highs are the, of all the same price or the lows are all of the same price, but they still form a wedge or a triangle. A break up and out, a break down and out signals a new trend. Now let's call in the head and shoulders, or some people call it an M pattern. M. I like to say it's a head and shoulders. I have a shoulder with the left side. I have a shoulder with the right side. And I've got my head up here. Well, if I kind of draw a stick man, you can see it's kind of like head and shoulders of a body. Okay. So what determines the breakout on this type of pattern? Well, the pattern itself is ruled by the height of the shoulders. The neckline is what it's called. Remember, this is where the head is. This is the neckline. So as we go up and roll over, we stop and then go back up. But then we get too far away and we come back. If we stop at the neckline and make this next move to the upside, this neckline becomes my trigger point or my tipping scale of do we go further to the downside or do we reject that and bounce to the upside? Head and shoulders can break either way. They can fail and move back higher or they can continue their head and shoulders higher probability move to a downside move in target. Now, what's our target? The downside move is the distance between head and neckline. Just add that to the bottom. That's your target. How about a failure of making this head and shoulders? And it reverses back to the upside. Okay. Your first target is the head once again. If it breaks the head, what's my next target to the upside? Well, it's this amplitude of movement that you just put it back to the upside. So your target would be up in here. All right. So that's the head and shoulders situation. That's a bearish head and shoulders that I've shown you here. Now, here's a reverse head and shoulders. This is what we're getting in the market today, a reverse head and shoulders. You come down, you bounce, and you come back down to the same low level. Okay, let's take a look. Let's take a look at this. Think of this as a head and shoulders reversal or uh, inverted head and shoulders. Here's one, there's two. This head and shoulders is kind of tipped this way. So I've come down, I've bounced, I've come down, I've bounced, but I failed. So I would say that this is my lower shoulder or left shoulder, this is my right shoulder, and this is my reversed head. It's in this angle that I want to be careful with. My breakthrough is when it gets below this level as a failure, 
of an inverted head and shoulders. What's my breakthrough to the upside? Well, it's got to be here on the same angle as my shoulders. Let me clean this up. This is the downward angle. And if I use the same downward angle, it should be about here. So I need to break above on the S&P 500, this 4465 level, to have this inverted head and shoulders absolutely confirm itself. So there's a real life example. All right. We also have triple tops, triple bottoms. A low, back up, equal low, back up, equal low, back up. Once it goes above the rollover peaks or highs and a breakout to the upside, there's your bullish pattern. Same thing on the downside. I go to a high, I go to a low. I go back to the same high. I go to back to about the same low. I go to the high. Once again, same. I come back to the low, but I fail. The trend now is to the downside. What's the target? The target is the distance between the low point and the high points. So this is your what's called a measured move. If this is five points up, then from this break, of these lows is five points to the downside. Standard technical analysis. All right, let's go on to Fibonacci's. These are a mathematical way of identifying reversal levels. Fibonacci found this sequence in nature and put it on or into trading by not Fibonacci himself, but by another gentleman later in the 70s. Most popular retracement numbers are key levels. 61.8, that's what's called the golden ratio. 38.2, the minor ratio. These are naturally occurring. Sequences are in nature all over the place. You see the storm here, the circular nature of these clouds. It tightens into a center. That's a Fibonacci. The shell of a Nautilus is in Fibonacci levels. Even our body, our body shows a Fibonacci makeup. Okay, from your outstretched hand to the bottom of your feet, there's 100%. The golden ratio, 61.8. That's from your feet to the top of your head. The minor ratio is another third from your head to the top of your hand. You can figure this as one, two, three and three. The torso, typically from torso to neck, is again that minor Fibonacci. This is very enlightening when you first realize that that happens to the human body that it's a mathematical calculation, foot to head, head to hand, that works, and it works in the market as well. Now, the one thing that I need to stress, there is no 50% Fibonacci. 50% is nothing more than halfway between the top and the bottom. It's not a mathematical progression. What do they do? The basics. How do you draw them? Well, we determine the most recent run in the stock. We look for the point where it changes direction, called a swing high and a swing low. And then we use the, the tool in the Thinkorswim platform that allows you to do that. 
So let's do this. We'll remove that. That's our trend line. All right, let's take a look. Most recent high. This is what's called a swing high because we went up, 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 and we rolled over. Well, we rolled over. We went to a low. We bounced. We went to another low. We bounced. We went to another low. We bounced. You've got one. You've got two. You've got three lower lows that you can use. You can draw Fibonacci's from this high using this low, this low, or this low. Depends on the time frame you want to look at. Let's use the high to the most recent low. So right-click, drawing tool, go to Fibonacci, go from high, go to low. This is high to low. The values may be skewed the other way. 61.8 may be in the bottom. 38.2 may be up here. But let's take a look at what's going on. If we come down one-third of the way, that's the minor Fibonacci. Actually, it's the inverse of 61.8, which is the 38.2. We came down close to it. Well, we kind of stopped. But then we cascaded all the way through that. We went down to the 61.8 reversal. Let me adjust this Fibonacci so it gives you the same type of look. So let's take it from the low to the high because this is a downtrend. There. Now we've got things looking right. We came down to a 38.2, hung around there for a millisecond, came down to the 61.8, stayed around this golden ratio level, bounced. Where do we bounce up to? The minor Fibonacci at 38.2. Where do we back off to? We backed off to what's called half back, the level of halfway between the high and the low. Why did this work? Why did 50% work? It's because everybody else that's using Fibonacci's also looks at this half back number. There's no mathematical reason for it. There's nothing more than other people are looking at. It. But we moved up. We bounced back down to half back. We bounced up. We bounced up. We bounced back above the 38.2, the minor Fibonacci failed to go higher, cascaded right through the halfback, came down to the golden ratio, 61.8, bounced back to halfback, came back to 61.8, lost that value, and then made our low. All right. Since we made a low, we also need to look for the retracement. Well, the retracement, first one you look for, is the first Fibonacci number, and at this point it's a 61.8 point or 61.8, or a third of the way back up. Attempted to go above it, failed, and came right back down. Now we're testing a full 100% retracement. So that's how Fibonacci's are used. That's how they're put on your charts. There's an example of it. I gave you a more relevant one on the current chart. There's an inverse of the Fibonacci. I showed you that. They're used to identify the end of a correction or a counter trend. Just another tool. Most Fibonacci's that we look at are these two. The 61.8, the golden Fibonacci and the 38.2. There are other ones. Once again, half back, halfway between high and low, called the 50% level. There's other minor retracements at 23.6 and 78, but those are not typically used. All right. How about projecting a valid price on your time horizon? Let's go through it. What do you do? Well, you've got to put down some values 
and figure out if it's going to be a profitable trade or not. First and foremost, you take a look at the price on the chart and say, is this going from lower left to upper right bullish or upper right to lower left bearish just by eyeballing the pricing? Number two, and I would say stop here and do this next. If you're not a, just a stock trader and you want to use options, take a look at their options chain to make sure that they have options that are more than just monthly options. If they do, great. Go ahead. Now, what else should you be looking at? I like to look at three things. I like to look at things in threes. So if I have things in threes, and I've got a stool with three legs, this thing is pretty stable, right? If I've only got two legs, it kind of can tip. So I've got three things I look for to see if an, an equity works as a trade. First of all, the fundamentals or the mathematical numbers. Are these good? Are they making money? Are they using their money wisely? And do they have the prospect of making money in the future? Are they, and this is sentiment, and I'm going to tell you this equals implied volatility. And that's why I say, look at your options chain. Do they have an expected move on the option chain that will give you some insight. This is your crystal ball, by the way. Insight as to where their price could be in the future. I'll let you into a little secret. Let's go to the let's go to the uh, the charts once again. Let's take a look at Apple. Apple's chart right now looks kind of bearish or stagnant if you take a longer look. But let's take a look at that sentiment, that what do I expect them to be in the future? How do I kind of figure that out? Well, the options market, the options chains, expirations, will give you a clue as to what traders are expecting the price to be. We've got a price at 155. Forget about tomorrow or Friday. That's there. Let's go out to the month of April, one month out. Options traders say, by the pricing of options, that Apple could move plus or minus 14 points from where it's currently at. Let's go to the chart. 14 points from 155. Okay. So in a month out here to April 18th, we can go, let's say it's 15 points. We can go to 170 or we can go to 140. That's what the options chain say is the potential movement based on volatility of Apple's price between now and a month from now. All right, it gives you an outside look at where price could be. All right, so that's your sentiment look at the stock. The last piece is the technical piece. Is it making higher lows? Is it making lower highs? Is it making lower lows? Is it making higher lows? What's the pattern? What do I see when I look at the prior prices? So here's a number of things you can do. On the fundamental side, what's their growth expected to be? Current price. Oops. 
What's their average move on a daily basis? It's called average true range. Is there a repetitive pattern in the past that you see that could happen again? Is that pattern a setup that you can use on your buy or sell of the equity? Okay. So there you have the fundamental side. So here's a checklist. Is the price pattern something that's in the favor that you like to trade? Confirmation. Is there volume that confirms this movement up or down? Or is it a declining volume that's saying, oh, that trend that I'm looking at is kind of suspect? Market sentiment. This is the volatility. Does the monthly and weekly chart look the same, or is there something that I should look at to be aware of? Where are the moving averages, the 20, the 50 moving averages? And in the case of Apple, the 200. All right, if you're using options, here's some criteria for evaluation of options. Does the time frame for my price expectation match up with the option expiry that I'm looking to use? Do the strikes that I'm looking to use make logical sense? Is it close enough that the price could get there? Is there a fair value in your estimation of the pricing of those options? Now, when you place an option trade, be comfortable with the price that you're using. Don't just put it out at market. Have a price in mind. It's better to, to uh, miss a trade than have to pay too much for a trade. So let the price come to you, if at all possible. So conclusion about technical trading and how you should use it to trade. Price and trend expectations should match. The time frame for that expectation should be available to you if you're using options. The pattern recognition of prior movement should help you out to give you a better handle on the expectation. The entry point, the location of the entry, does it fall into a moving average area or a Fibonacci area? And is the option price that you're using a fair value, your estimation of fair? Is the difference between the bid and the ask something that you can live with? Remember, you buy at the retail, you sell at the wholesale. So you buy at the ask, you sell at the bid. If that difference between bid and ask is your profit, then you're in the wrong equity or in the wrong option because things can go wrong. All right. Here's that example about technical charting, and I'm going to run through it real quickly. We start with a blank chart. We add in some trend lines once again. Starting point, first touch, second touch, third touch, fourth touch. Once again, first touch, second touch, third touch. Oops, breaks it, breaks it. Now, let's draw off the tops to kind of make a channel. Here, we've got just an expansion of dates. We've got a downward trend line meeting an upward trend line. There's your triangle or wedge. We've got a double bottom. By the way, this looks a lot like the S&P 500 right now. Do we have a trend reversal? Well, let's go on. Oh, we did. The 20 moving average crossed up 
the implied volatility started to ramp up. We've got a confirmation of price moving up for three days. Oh, there's a buy signal, at least in this chart. So we buy on the buy signal. We follow the trend. We follow the trend. We follow the trend. Trade exit. Why did I do this? Because I had a reversal of price, and it came below the prior day's low on a gap open to the downside. I'm out. Well, maybe I'm still profitable on the trade, but I don't want to be out. So I can then buy I can buy insurance called a long put. So if we bought a long put and this thing continued on, it bounced back up. Puts not needed. Oh, well, wait a minute. Here we have what's called a triple cross. Then it dropped below the trend line. And it dropped below my bearish setup time. So now I've got a confirmation on this chart that I want to do a bearish trade. And I've got an entry point and price. And I've got a target to where I think it could go to, the prior low. So I take the trade. And it gets to my target. And it's an exit. Because it's gone through, number one, my primary target. Number two, it's gone through with what's called a huge bottoming tail hammer. And I'll take my profits now and come back and think about trading it again. And what does it do? It just bounces around, bounces around, bounces around. So it consolidates. It's a stagnant trend. It finds a low, finds a high. It goes back to the low, goes back to the high. Yes, you can trade this with advanced types of option trading. We'll pass by it for now. Now, it makes a break above that channel or that box. Sets up for a bullish trade. Oh, wait a minute. Got to have confirmation a couple of days. Then it backs off. Then it takes off again. My confirmation comes when I break above the breakout point and continue on. Now I have an entry trade, entry, pardon me, a, an entry for the trade, plus I know what I've got for a target. My target is the prior high. And I take the trade and it reaches the target. I exit the trade. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. But it continues on. Uh-oh. Continues, continues. But now, I've got something fundamental I need to be aware of. I've got earnings coming up. Do I want to be involved on this unknown thing called earnings that could change my price quite a bit? I typically do not like to move and ride a trade over earnings. So the train got away. Earnings were fantastic. The stock went ballistic. I feel like a fool. No, I don't. There's always another train at the station that I can get. I made a profit. I worked it properly. All I missed out on was potentially more profit. I still had a winning situation. Don't beat yourself up on opportunities lost. Congratulate yourself on opportunities taken and won. And there you have it, folks. That's the end of technical trading and a little walkthrough of how you can use the chart to your advantage. Did I spell something wrong? <laughs> I'll go back and do a spell check. Sorry about that. All right, folks, any questions before I wrap it up? Let's take a look at the market and see how it's doing. Just about ready to open for trading on the futures. Let's get this up on the big chart. 
Let's go to a one minute chart. Let's see how they're going to open it up. Sitting here at 42.49, pretty much flat from where it closed. We've got about 50 seconds. All right, let me go find that H in height. You got me thinking now. I've got to review, spell check. That's okay. Spell check. Ah, want to remove that. I want to delete that. Put a space in there. Okay, can't find it. We'll save that. Let's see how the market. Okay, topping tail. We had here. Here's a technical terminology. We had buyers go and try to have price followed at higher and higher and higher pricing nobody followed through above the 4252 level therefore you've got a stop of price at least in this bar at a level where did it stop at this is the 20 simple moving average so price opened and went right up to this 20 simple and backed off now we've got more buyers trying to push it back to the upside once again. Buyers are saying, I'll pay you this. No, you got to pay me that. I'll pay you this. I got to pay you that. No, no, no. Back and forth, back and forth. Closes higher than it opened. Now the new bar opens. Again, a look below, kind of investigate who's down there selling. Nobody's selling. So I'm going to be a buyer again. Now I'm a buyer more. I'm a buyer more. And it's going up. You can infer that these are investigational price action for this time frame. All right, folks, that's it. After 6 o'clock, let me get this out to you on a replay. Thank you all for being with me here on the 15th of March. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, and we'll catch you the next time. Bye-bye.